We continue where we left off. But Putin ran home as fast as he could. He had long had a passport made out in a false name. It is extraordinary that this careful little man, a petty despot within his family, a government employee, although a follower of Fourier, and above all a capitalist and moneylender, had long nursed the fantastic notion that he must have a false passport that he could use to escape abroad if he envisaged the possibility of that if. True, he himself couldn't have formulated exactly what he expected might happen. I'm going to go ahead and read that in another one. because. So here's Magarshak, same paragraph. He had long before procured himself a passport made out in a false name. It seems absurd that this punctilious little man, this petty family tyrant, who clung to his job in the civil service, though a Fourierist, and who was above all a capitalist and moneylender, should long before have conceived the fantastic idea of getting that passport ready in case of emergency so as to be able to escape abroad if. He therefore must have entertained the possibility of this if, though, of course, he himself would have found it very difficult to formulate what this if might mean. And now, just for fun, Pavir Velikonsky, same paragraph. He had long kept ready a passport in a different name. It is wild even to think that this precise little man, a petty family tyrant, a functionary in any case, though a Fourierist, and finally, before all else, a capitalist and moneylender had long, long ago conceived within himself the fantastic notion of readying this passport just in case so as to slip abroad with its help if. So he did allow for the possibility of this if, though, of course, he himself was never able to formulate precisely what this if might signify. But now it suddenly formulated itself and in the most unexpected way. That desperate idea with which he had come to Kirillov's after hearing Peter Stepanovich's moron on the sidewalk consisted in abandoning everything tomorrow at daybreak and expatriating abroad. Whoever does not believe that such fantastic things happen in our everyday reality even now may consult the biographies of all real Russian emigres abroad. Not one of them fled in a more intelligent or realistic way. It is all the same unbridled kingdom of phantoms and nothing more. Now I'm going to go back from Pavirvo Lakonsky to McAndrew. I'm going to read that same paragraph that I just read. The first thing Laputin did when he got home was to grab a suitcase and start packing. Oh, excuse me. That's the next paragraph. But now it formulated itself and in the most unexpected form. The desperate idea that had flashed through his head when Peter insulted him on the sidewalk was of dropping everything and fleeing abroad himself first thing in the morning. Those who cannot believe that such fantastic things are a daily occurrence in Russia should dig into the life histories of Russian emigres living abroad. None of them had a better or more real reason to escape. They all had to flee from mad realms created in their own imaginations and peopled with phantoms of their own making. And yes, we will do Magarshak. But now it suddenly formulated itself and in a most unexpected manner, that desperate idea with which he had gone to Kirillov's after Peter Verkovinsky had called him a fool in the street was that he would abandon everything early next morning and emigrate abroad. Those who do not believe that such fantastic things are happening every day in Russia should consult the biographies of all our real emigres. Not one of them ran off for a more intelligent and realistic reason. It has always been the same unrestrained kingdom of phantoms and nothing more. This is the only one 
that I see where they mention the name Kirillov. So correct me if I'm wrong, but only this one said, that desperate idea with which he had gone to Kirillov's after Peter Verkovinsky had called him a fool. And I remember, of course, that uh, Pavir Velikonsky said moron, and that uh, Andrew R. McAndrew didn't mention any particular uh, derogatory name calling. And now we will continue with Bogarshak. On his arrival home, Laputin began by locking himself in, getting out his suitcase, and beginning to pack. His main preoccupation was money and how much of it he would have time to raise. Yes, to raise. For according to his ideas, he had not an hour to spare because as soon as it got light, he would have to be on his way. Nor did he know how he would manage to get into the train. He vaguely decided to take it at the second or third big station from our town and make his way there on foot if necessary. It was thus that he busied himself instinctively and mechanically with his suitcase, his head in a whirl of ideas, when suddenly he stopped short, relinquished everything, and with a deep groan stretched himself on the sofa. He perceived clearly and in a flash that he might run away all right, but that he was absolutely incapable of deciding now whether he should run away before or after Shatov had been disposed of. That now he was just a gross, impassive body, an inert mass, that he was entirely in the power of a terrible external force, and that though he had a passport and though he could run away from Shatov, otherwise what was his hurry? He would run away not before Shatov had been disposed of and not from Shatov, but most certainly after Shatov. And that all that had already been decided, signed, and sealed, in unbearable anguish, trembling every moment, and surprised at himself, groaning and holding his breath in turn, he somehow managed to carry on, locked up in his room and lying on the sofa, till 11 o'clock the following morning. It was then that the shock came which he was expecting and which steeled him for what was to happen that day. No sooner had he unlocked his room and gone out to his household at 11 o'clock than he was told that the escaped convict Fedka, who was terrorizing the town, the robber of churches, who had only the day before committed murder and arson, and whom our police were looking for but could not catch, had been found murdered early that morning, seven miles from the town, at the spot where the high road turned towards the village of Zaccarino, and that the whole town was talking of it already. He at once rushed out of the house to find out the particulars of the murder. He learnt, first of all, that Fedka, who was found with his skull smashed in, had apparently been robbed, and secondly, that the police had good reason to suspect, and even good grounds for believing, that his murderer was the Spigulin workman Fomka, the same man who had been his accomplice in killing the Lebyatkins and setting fire to their house, and that they had apparently quarreled on the road about a large sum of money Fedka had stolen from Lebyatkin and was supposed to have hidden. Laputin rushed to Peter's lodgings and succeeded in learning at the back door in secret that though Peter had not returned home before one o'clock in the morning, he had been peacefully asleep up to eight o'clock. There could be no doubt whatever that there was nothing unusual in Fedka's death and that people of Fedka's occupation quite often came to such an end, but the coincidence of the fatal words uttered by Peter, namely that, quote, it was the last time Fedka would be drinking vodka, end of quote, with the prompt fulfillment of the prophecy, was so significant that Laputin suddenly gave up hesitating. The shock had been administered it was as though a huge boulder had fallen on him and crushed him forever. Returning home, he silently pushed his suitcase back under the bed with his foot and at the appointed hour in the evening, he was the first to arrive at the place fixed for the meeting with Shatov, still with his passport in his pocket, it is true. <laughs> 